Okay. Okay. Today. Hey, I'm going to be around most of the time, but I have to run to the labs a few times. Okay. So if you need me, call myself. Oh, okay. Fine. All right. Today we're going to start looking at the basic tissues uh, and the first two, the epithelial and the connective tissues. For those of you who have just come in, there is a fetch link. What did you say it was in a, a, a drop box somewhere? Okay, to for the epithelial lecture. The uh, Blackboard server is overloaded. It can't keep up with everything, and I don't know how this is going to work when we get further into the semester, because I think Eastside just started. <laughs> so um, anyway, you can use that link for the first part for the epithelial tissues, and then go into uh, lecture note aids for the connective tissues. Once they get the problem resolved, I will try to get PowerPoints also posted for you. But right now, all we could get posted were PDFs, and we're lucky we got one of each of those for each of the lectures. Uh, today, what I want to do is start out with the epithelial tissues, and then move into the connective tissues. And as you'll see, these two tissue types uh, work together as a unit. The connective tissues can pretty much stand alone, and, but the epithelial tissues, because they are a vascular, need to have connective tissues nearby. Um, the, in terms of the basic tissue types, there are four. Two that we'll deal with today, and then two, the muscular and nervous tissues, which will be dealt with by Dr. Bongarzon next week. Uh, epithelial and connective tissues both get classified based on morphology, whereas the muscular and the nervous tissues are classified according to their function, i.e. Contra contractility or the ability to uh, conduct an impulse. The epithelial tissues are ubiquitous. They, you will find them in virtually every organ that you're going to study. In fact, the only one, where, only tissue where you probably won't find them will be if you have an isolated piece of hyaline cartilage, in which case that is an avascular tissue and there is no epithelium around. But epithelia line all the blood vessels, they line the heart, they line all of the uh, organs, the tubular organs in the body, they line all of the closed cavities in the body. So they're around in virtually every section you're going to see. Um, the, uh, so they will be, they come from all three of the trilaminar layers. And if you have not yet had this, have you heard about the trilaminar disc yet? Embryos, okay, embryos going to be coming up next week, and Dr. Pescatelli, who was just up here, will be giving you uh, embryo lectures, I think right after Labor Day, before we get into the growth lab. The connective tissues and muscular tissues come from the middle layer, or mesoderm, specifically from a tissue called mesenchyme that we're going to look at. And then the nervous tissues come from ectoderm, the uppermost layer. In terms of the epithelial and the connective tissues, epithelial tissues have very closely opposed cells. They have a protective function. And uh, they form barriers, in some cases mechanical, uh, sometimes physical. They are, uh, they're absorptive. They uh, lubricate. And uh, they can withstand friction. And we will see those properties as we go through. The connective tissues, on the other hand, have a lot of extracellular material around them. 
They're supporting tissues, and they're very important. These are the tissues you're going to learn to hate in the gross lab because you have to dig through them to get what you consider to be the good stuff in order to get down to an artery and a nerve or to get down to the muscles. You're going to have to go through fat and fascia and all kinds of stuff. Uh, and if you have a really fat cadaver, there's a lot to go through. Uh, there. I'm going to be in the gross lab with you, so I'll be digging around too. Okay, so um, in terms of the region between them, there is a, an extra cellular region called the basal lamina that is a boundary region between the epithelial and the connective tissues, and it helps to compartmentalize these two tissues. That's a very important structure, and we're going to be looking at that in some detail. So what I want to do today, then, is start out with the epithelial tissues, look at the basal lamina, and then look at the connective tissues. Now, the one thing I've been cautioned about from Dr. Art is that I do not talk between 1, 2.58 and 3 o'clock when the recording goes off. There's two minutes when it goes off, but I'm going to give you breaks before then, okay? Just so you know, you can come and ask questions then, but we can't do anything because echo will be off. All right. In terms of the epithelia, they get classified as either covering or surface, and some of the books will now say, you know, these classifications really don't mean anything because they are so, such active tissues. They can take many shapes and many forms. But it gives some uh, mode of putting them into a category where you can deal with them. So they form the sheets that will line all of the tubular organs, everything from lining the male and female reproductive tracts to the urinary tract, the respiratory system, and the entire uh, digestive system from the oral cavity all the way down to the anal opening. Right? All of those have sheets of epithelial cells covering them, and because they form barriers, uh, they will have some special membrane specializations in terms of junctions and just uh, specializations for dealing with the milieu that they're in that will help you to recognize where they are from because those specializations are very much based on what their function is within an organ system. Uh, simple or stratified, one layer, more than one. Uh, what shape are their cells? Are they flat? Are they high? Well, Actually, in many cases, the shape of the cell is going to vary depending on the activity of the cell, right? But in more active tissues, they tend to be higher. I am not going to go through all of these classifications because your lab manual does it very well, and it's going to walk you through it. What I want to do is I want to go through those specializations that are unique for the epithelia and try to relate them to the function of the tissues right, in which they're going to be found. The uh, other types of epithelia are glandular epithelia, and those include all of the exocrine glands, that is, glands that have ducts that will secrete onto a surface, and the endocrine glands, glands that produce hormones, other paracrine factors that will either secrete into the blood system or into the surrounding connective tissues. Uh, then there are also going to be some specialized epithelial cells that uh, can be found in the retina and other places. We won't be dealing with those. Um, as I said, they came from all three layers. The cells are very, very closely opposed. They have specialized cell junctions to either hold them to each other or to attach them or anchor them to the underlying connective tissue. They dis uh, display polarity. And I know uh, Dr. Rogowski will talk about this a little bit in her lecture in terms of 
their membrane domains and in terms of the function and how that cell is functioning related to those domains and related to its environment. So the, uh, we'll go through this in a minute. Regeneration is important. They are able to regenerate and make a very exact replica of the tissue that was already there. And this is as opposed to the process of healing where you don't necessarily get the same kind of cells. <coughs> you get a replacement for it to fill in a gap, but they can regenerate and renew themselves. Uh, they are, as I said, a vascular. They make the basal lamina, a good portion of it, and the sheets are going to form a selective barrier. And from these epithelial sheets, it's where those glands are going to be derived embryonically. And there are going to be times when you're going to look at this and say, well, some of these glands look very easy, very simple. Uh, there's one we're going to be looking at called a goblet gland, goblet cell that's just a simple unicellular gland, mucus gland. There are others like the salivary glands that have more depth to it. Then there are glands like the pancreas and the liver that we'll be looking at in about a month that also are derived from these epithelial sheets that have been lining, that line the GI tract embryonically. And so they're very complex. Uh, the endocrine glands lose their attachment to the surface and they become very highly vascularized. So in glands like the pancreas, where you have both an endocrine and a, a major exocrine component, you're, you'll have major ducts going into or still connected to the epithelia lining the tubular portion of the tract and also islands of endocrine cells that are surrounded by a very extensive capillary network. And this is just a, an example of the goblet cell. We're going to see these fairly often. This is an epithelium from the respiratory tract. It's uh, actually called the pseudostratified epithelium. And we'll go through all this, don't panic yet. Uh, it, it's got a, a modification, cilia, something to keep and move particles, and mucus across the surface. And here it has a very prominent basal lamina. And what you should note is that when you're looking at an epithelium, there are many closely opposed cells, and you see many nuclei that are very closely opposed and orderly, and when you get down into the connective tissue, you wind up with fewer nuclei and much more extracellular material between them. There's very little extracellular space here. Uh, the glands are classified as either serous or mucus, depending on the type of secretion, and uh, the goblet cells are going to be mucus in nature. As I said, I'm not going to deal with the general organization. Your lab manual will do that. But what I do want to uh, call your attention to is the fact that you're going to be looking at web slides that have been cut from various solid blocks of tissue from organs. And depending on how that cut was taken, sometimes they look really nice, like they do on the pictures and the diagrams in the book. And most of the micrographs in your book are very nice because somebody spent a lot of time trying to get that exact perpendicular cut. Uh, but for the most part, and even if you're, when you're getting things from pathology, things are going to be oblique cuts and at different angles. The other thing is that those tissues, those cells, were three-dimensional. But they've been cut to a very thin slice. And in doing that, the tissues get distorted. And then you throw a cover slip on top of them, and you really spread them out. This is what happens with blood slides. Dr. Becker showed you some really neat pictures, I'm sure, of blood smears, where you could see those nuclei spread out for the neutrophils and 
and the basophils with all of their granules. But if you just take a piece of bone marrow or you take a, a drop of blood and you don't really spread it out and flatten it out or flatten out bone marrow sites, you don't see all of that detail, right? Because it's bunched up. So this is, it's very distorted, it can be very distorted, and you have to take that into effect. However, when you get into the organ systems, if you can think in three dimensions, which is what you have to do, you have to take this back and think in three dimensions, it will reinforce your gross anatomy. And I think the best example of it is in the cardiovascular lab when you're doing the heart because the cuts that they have taken and given you through the heart and through the aorta, and as they come through different chambers, and you have to really sit and think about the anatomy of the heart to be able to analyze it. If you can do it, it'll make you a better gross anatomist also, okay? So, I do like Gary Larson. Okay, um, so, epithelial cell membranes. You have to think in three dimensions. So, picture this as being three cells, or three cans in a six-pack. Can you do that for me? Okay. You've got a six-pack of Pepsi, Bud, whatever. <laughs> Red Bull, it's Friday night. Okay. Uh, <laughs> all right. So, you've got a six-pack, and these, the, the cells are lined up and they have a plastic rim around the top that is holding them together, and there are going to be these bands of cell junctions near the top that are going to hold the cells together, just like that plastic band holds them together. So these are continuous zones or belts around the cells, right? And they will attach all of the cells in the sheet together at the top. Then there also are going to be some junctions that are going to be spot kind of junctions where the cells will either communicate with each other or they're going to hold each other together, right? And then there will be some also spot junctions where they will be holding on to the extracellular matrix. So we call these different zones, these membrane domains, and the top portion is the apical portion, and that will have specializations of the membrane that uh, deal with the cell and to the exterior functions, okay? The lateral domain will have cell-to-cell -cell types of interactions. There are going to be some junctions here, there are going to be some uh, foldings of the membrane to increase it, and then uh, finally in the basal domain, it will be cell to matrix interactions. And remember that below this, we're going to have that extracellular structure, the basal lamina, that will separate this compartment from the connective tissue compartment, right? So remember, we're gonna think in three dimensions. Now this, I'm not gonna go into glycocalyx, but just to remind you that on the apical portion of the cell is the glycocalyx, uh, and this cell slide is from Dr. Wagowski wilkes lecture. Uh, there are a few more of hers in here, and this is to remind you that those cell biology lectures gave you the very basics. Now we're taking that and we're building on it. Today, next week, we'll be building tissues. After that, all of those tissues get built into organs. And concurrently, you'll go up to the gross lab and see those organs making up an organism, okay? So, just remember, glycocalyx, I'm not going to go into it. Yes? Mostly on microvilli, okay. Uh, cilia, for the most part, have, uh, are picking up mucus and dust particles or moving other things apart. The glycocalyx has a lot of receptors in it. And it's good, it also has a lot of cell recognition molecules. Um, 
In terms of the apical domain specializations then, we're looking at things that are either going to increase cell surface area or that will be moving fluid or particles across the surface. So I know Dr. Wilk went through some of this, and you've heard some of this from Dr. Uh, Brady also in the cytoskeletal and cytomotor lectures. So I'm going to be uh, not repeating it all, but kind of jogging your memory and reminding you that, hey, they said this before. That must mean it's important enough for you to remember it. Okay. All right. So in terms of those things that will increase the cell surface area, we're looking for those outreaches of the cell membrane, the microvilli and the stereocilia, which have cores of what? Huh? Actin, right, okay. And they are involved with absorption in both cases. A stereocilia found in the male reproductive tract, and then there are also some sensory stereocilia that are found in the ear. Cilia, on the other hand, um, are responsible for fluid and particle movement across the surface. Now, the, I hope you all have the sixth edition, and you don't have the fifth edition, okay? Because there has been a lot of microbiology added to the sixth edition that wasn't there before. And it includes uh, a section on cilia and primary and nodal cilia, which weren't in the other previous editions. Uh, the, the cilia are motile, and they have a core of what? Microtubules, right, in that 9 plus 2 arrangement. But the other two types, the primitive, uh, primitive, the primary and the nodal cilia, have a 9 plus 0 arrangement. They don't have this central core. Well, they are not necessarily, in, at least in terms of the primary ones, they are not set up for moving things across the surface. So let's look at that in a minute. So this is the modal cilium. Hmm? And it has that 9 plus 2 arrangement. And it has two proteins, dynein and nexin, that help to hold those doublet tubules together. There are also some radial spokes in here, too, that help to hold everything together to these uh, two middle uh, tubules. In addition, it has a couple of other things in the region of the basal body, right? Here's the cell membrane. And the region below is called the basal body. Comes from, uh, during development, comes, comes from centrioles. And within the region of that basal body are some structures that help to hold the cilium in place, which includes an, what's called the alar sheath, which holds and connects to the plasma membrane, and uh, the rootlet, striated rootlet, which anchors the cilium into the cytoplasm. Okay? And then there is also a structure about midway down in the basal body called the basal foot. All right, so these are important. There is, cilia are present in many regions of the body, uh, particularly the respiratory tract, in the uh, female reproductive tract, in the oviduct, and of course in the flagellum of the sperm. And the flagellum of the sperm and the cilium are working in the same way. There are, there are disease syndromes that can affect the structure of this cilium. And uh, one in general is called immodal ciliary syndrome. Now, uh, it causes something called ciliary dyskinesia. Dyskinesia meaning um, 
impairment of the movement. Now, ciliary dyskinesia can occur, oh, maybe from uh, uh, passively, uh, acutely from a toxicity of some sort or a trauma, and the cilia can come back. But there are some cases where it is a primary ciliary dyskinesia and it's hereditary. And in that case, it affects many, it can affect many different organs. And there are many different syndromes that are classified as primary ciliary dyskinesia. But they all uh, show signs to some extent of impairment of the movement of the cilia and generally uh, many uh, bronchorespiratory problems since there are a lot of cilia in there lining the tract. Um, in one, Cartagena's syndrome, the dynaean arms are missing and the basal feet are not oriented correctly. The basal feet are, are um, believed to be oriented in the direction for movement, for coordinating movement of the cilia in a wave-like manner. And if they are not oriented correctly, then the movement is uh, impaired. The uh, dynein arms help to anchor these tubelets together, and they're important for the movement. And if you remember, dynein was one of those motor proteins that Dr. Brady talked about. Mm-hmm. Okay. So, and also, and ooh, the chances of seeing this in the gross lab are very slim. PCD isn't that great, uh, that prominent a disease, but 50% of patients who have PCD, that is primary ciliary dyskinesia, have something called situs inversus. Uh, there are cilia, nodal cilia, that during embryonic development that help to direct the movement out of the nodes of cells to form and to locate the organs within the body and particularly within the abdominal cavity where you have, where you don't always have bilateralism. Uh, and in situs inversus, things are reversed. The heart's on the right, the liver's on the left. And if it's also been someone who's had surgery, it can get very confusing. We actually had a cadaver a couple of years ago that had situs inversus. And it was challenging for the instructors, <laughs> as well as students. OK. So when you see then some, uh, a picture of cilia and EM, you will see what these basal bodies what we've known as basal bodies and what you will see even on a light micrograph as a basal body. But as you can see, when you start to bring up this magnification, you're now getting more detail in terms of these basal bodies. And you can actually start to pick up things like that portion of the cilium that's going to attach this darkened region here to the, ba the plasma membrane. Here's the plasma membrane. The basal feet, note that they are in one direction, hmm? all coming out in one direction, and that rootlet that's going to anchor the psyllium down. And you can see very nice defined microtubules, which you don't pick up in the microvillus. Um, in terms of the development of cilia called ciliogenesis, there are two motor proteins involved, kinesin and dynein. And uh, I will tell you that the positive end of the cilium is up at the top. All right, so it grows from the top out. And you then should be sure that you remember from Dr. Brady's lectures which ones work on the positive side and which one works on the negative side. Okay, and it's in the book. Okay, <laughs> all right. In terms of primary cilia, virtually all eukaryotic cells are going to have a primary cilia, but it doesn't have that doublet in the middle. It isn't motile. It's mostly for 
sensory, maybe for volume changes, things of that sort. Uh, this Dr. Uh, Rogalski wolf showed you a primary cilium scanning EM uh, from the kidney tubule, from kidney cell. I'm using the fibroblast here because we're going to be talking about fibroblasts in a few minutes. Huh? So uh, this then primary cilium here is sensory for that fibroblast, okay? There's, some of them are used as mechanoreceptors, osmotic receptors. It depends where the cell is. Uh, quickly, just to review these, now on the light level, this is, uh, it's actually a toluidine blue stain. Most of the stains we have are H&E stains, okay? But every now and then we get a different one tossed in. And toluidine blue is what's called a vital stain. And it's one that is, a, it's a very quick stain in, in terms of processing for the tissue. It's used uh, for getting a preview of uh, tissues for electron microscopy. So they use toluidine blue because it can be used very quickly. And uh, so here we have these nice tall cells hmm, that are very closely opposed. And on the apical portion, the lumen is up here. Hmm. Here is here are cells that have more, are much more displaced. They aren't as rigidly uh, oriented. This is the connective tissue, and not as prominent as it was in the respiratory tract. The basal lamina is in this region. Uh, you have a nucleus, and here is the intercellular space. Uh, this is uh, from the intestinal epithelium and it, these are absorptive cells. And so one of the things that the intestinal epithelia have, and it, indeed in the gallbladder, are some lateral interdigitations, okay? Uh, increase, increasing surface membrane on the lateral region, not to increase the surface area for absorption as we do up here, in the apical region, but to provide some extra space for fluid that's being brought into the system. And the same occurs in the gallbladder for concentration of bile as water is being pulled out of the bile, being stored in the bladder and uh, brought back into the system, into the connective tissues. Uh, Columnarts, these are the cilia. This is the same one we saw before. Cilia are much less regular. Hmm? They're longer. Uh, you'll see that there will be basal bodies, usually a dark dot. You can bring this up on EM, has, I mean on the microscope. Has Dr. Art gone through the web slides at all and shown you how to use them? Okay, we're going to try to do a couple of them at least at the end of the lecture to give you an idea. Right? Uh, and then stereocilia from the male tract. Okay, and I've given you the references here. It works be much better if you personally look at it in the book or look at it on your web slide. Okay, and here are those goblet cells, those simple unicellular mucus glands. Okay, so let's get out of the. Oh, one other thing, sorry about that. In terms of uh, apical specializations, there's one other specialization that occurs. It's very limited, okay, to increase surface area. And it is something called membrane plaques. Your book doesn't even bring it into play in the epithelium lecture. But what it is, it occurs in the urinary system, in transitional epithelium, which is lining the ureters, the passages coming out of the kidney and going into the bladder, right? Where it's adjusting to the volume of urine coming through. And these plaques, which are thickenings in the membrane, are connected to invaginations or vesicles that go down into the cytoplasm.
So that when you look at a bladder or a picture, a picture of the ordinary bladder or uh, a picture of, I wonder if I have one here. I do, I'm going to show it to you right now. Bingo. Okay. So these cells are rounded. Okay? And not flattened out. When you have urothelium, which is the bladder epithelium, you don't have this picture, all right? In order to get the silly thing on, we had to take part of this out. And this is what we took out. Um, sorry. Uh, anyway, there, in order to fill with uh, urine or to, to cause distension in that bladder, there are thick things in the membrane, which you can see on EM, and that have these, vesicle, these uh, vesicles that are in the cytoplasm and remain attached to the membrane, calling, causing these little clefts. And when the bladder fills up then, there is this excess membrane that can spread out to account for an increase in the capacity of the ureter or the urinary bladder. So membrane plaques, and it's limited in that it only occurs in urothelium, that is the uh, place, the uh, epithelium that lines the urinary passages. Okay. Now we're going to go back to the lateral membrane. All right. This is the region of cell-to-cell -cell interaction. And these junctions fall under the classification of it adhering junctions. So adhering junctions are going to have some uh, major components that will be intracellular, and then transmembrane. And what you have now are two cells coming together. So there will be identical, there will be the same components on either side. Uh, intracellularly, there's going to be some sort of a cytoskeletal element, either microfilaments, that is actin, or intermediate filaments. And that Intermediate filament is going to change depending on what tissue you're dealing with, right? Okay, then there'll be some kind of a link protein that's going to link that intermediate filament to the membrane and membrane protein. Now, there then is a protein that will transverse the membrane and will react with a like protein from the adjacent cell, all right? And these proteins are going to fall into three classes. Occludins and cloudins, which are in very tight junctions where we're restricting flow between the cells. The cotterins, which uh, are, uh, they actually stand for, this word comes from calcium adhering proteins, okay? Calcium-dependent adhering proteins. And these um, are, for the most part, they're connected with uh, junctional complexes that are holding two cells together, uh, including that one of those belt complexes. And then there are the integrins. And the integrins are connected to matrix proteins, right? So in terms of the lateral domain, the three major junctions are those two belts that we looked at, remember in the six pack? Okay. Uh, the top one always being the tight junction, the occluding one, which is called the zonula occludens, which is kind of cool because that helps you to think of that occluding protein, okay, occludens. And then uh, the zonula adherens, which is the, uh, has cotterin in it, all right, as its protein. And then the macula adherens, also uh, cotterins. But the difference being that both of these two, zonula, indicating that they are belts that go around the entire cell so that there's a complete 
uh, junction between, on all sides of the cell with the adjacent cells, and macula, a spot, right, some macular degeneration, spot-like uh, uh, spot -like areas, a macula adherence, also called the desmosome, all right, which is a spot-like junction. Now, these three together form what's called a junctional complex or on light microscopy, what we call the terminal bar. And we'll look at those in a minute. Also, there is uh, another a communicating junction, the gap junction or the nexus found in muscle tissues. Uh, you probably hear about that next week and in, in the intestinal tissues and nerve tissues. Uh, I'm not going to go into the gap junction. Dr. Rogalski's lecture. Okay. Remember it for next week. Okay, so the junctional complex and the terminal bar. Zonula cludens, zonula adherens, macula adherens. Zozoma. Okay, zozoma. Just remember what the letters stand for, all right? Um, on light microscopy, it appears as a terminal bar, and that terminal bar appears as a little dot up at the top of the cell. So I, students, you probably won't do this quite as much, but students would often go into the lab looking for these things, saying, well, isn't it this thing? Like, no, these are all microvilli up here, and it's just this little bitty dot. Uh, but all of these structures are within that little dot. Uh, this is in, taken from the gallbladder, and uh, it, once again, we're looking at concentration. We've got, we're trying to restrict movement of what's going to come into the cell, so there's a tight junction up here where that ter in that terminal bar. On EM, the zonula occludens has two very closely opposed membranes, with microfilaments attached. The two proteins that are going to be the transmembrane proteins are the occludens and the cloudins. We'll talk about that in a minute. The zonial adherens is spaced a little further apart. It's not quite as tight. It has, once again, the microfilaments or actin filaments attached. The transmembrane protein is going to be a cotterin. This is more of a stabilizing structure uh, to help to maintain the junction and help to stabilize this upper junction, which is the tight one. And then the macula adherens, not always found uh, in the junctional complex depending on the cut because it is just a spot. But it's also found in many other cells. Uh, the macular adherence or the desmosome is uh, very prominent in skin. Skin takes a lot of abuse, a lot of friction. So there are many desmosomes in layers of skin holding them together. Uh, it's part of the intercalated disc that you'll see in cardiac muscle next week, holding those cardiac muscle cells together, okay? Uh, it is connected with, if you remember from Dr. Brady's lecture, intermediate filaments being very, helping uh, structural stability within the cell. And if this was in the skin, which is uh, the epidermis of the skin is an epithelium, what kind of an intermediate filament would it be? Keratin. Keratin, okay. But if it was in cardiac muscle, what would the intermediate filament be? Didn't get this one yet, right? Desmond, okay. So it would be a different one, same structure, okay, same cytoskeletal element, but a different protein content in it. And then uh, the uh, proteins inside here are those calcium-dependent adhering proteins. In terms of ZO, the zonula occludens, uh, there are two pathways. 
One is called the transcellular pathway, where receptors and channels and pores that are there up in the apical membrane are going to be directing what's coming into the cell. And then there is the paracellular pathway, the one that will allow very small ions and molecules, water, to come in between uh, the cells. Uh, there was an instructor in physio who used to call this the leaky junction. She taught GI because it does let some things in. It's not totally closing it off. Uh, within this region are the occludins and the uh, cloudins, and aqueous channels then are formed within that junction. Remember, it's a belt, okay? So it's a limited amount here. And the amount of water that can get through the number of uh, aqueous channels is uh, proportional to the number of cloudin molecules that are in here, all right? So the number of channels that you have will determine how permeable things are. Uh, there are a number of regulatory proteins in here, signaling proteins. Now, uh, including one called ZO that helps to bind the things and uh, keep this junction in place. What happens in some disease states, and particularly in food poisoning, okay, uh, where the enterotoxin from clostridium will come in and it will bind to the plaque protein that's out here that's called ZO1, and when it does this, that protein breaks down and it also breaks down the junction, all right? The strands get broken down. When that junction gets broken down, you get not only water that can come in this way, but what else? Water leaving the system and you wind up with diarrhea. That's not the, this is not the only thing Okay, that's going to cause diarrhea. Other, uh, other bacterias and viruses will, and antibiotics will work in different ways, but this is one that will cause diarrhea by breaking down this particular junction. Okay. okay, we saw that we had belts over here. We don't need to do that. Let's go look at the desmosome. Okay, so the desmosomes. Okay, they're going to be sites for intermediate filaments, and they have this very large plaque on the outside, which you can just subjacent to the plasma membrane, and it includes things like proteins called desmoplakin and placoglobin. And then there are transmembrane proteins like desmoglein, which are, remember they're cotterins, that form this very distinct banded structure within the intercellular space. So this is a very classic picture of a desmosome. All desmosomes look like this. That is a hint. And, you know, it may not be this desmosome, but if it has those characteristics, know what that structure can do, where you might find it. At this point, you don't have to recognize all of the uh, organs that they're coming from, but you should know this structure and know that it's going to be found in areas where you need to have a lot of stability and a, a strong attachment. Okay, so here we then are in desmosomes. This is from uh, skin. Skin, the epidermis, the epithelium of the skin, epidermis, all right, uh, on top of the dermis, which is the connective tissue of the skin, uh, is multilayered, stratified, and in the region, uh, immediately above the, oops, sorry, the renewing cells, there are cells that have a lot of desmosomes in them. Okay, so that you can see you have these gaps here, and if you bring this up, you'll see that there are little spokes here that, are, uh, that, that look like little spines, and that's because the desmosomes have held so closely, such, have such a tight attachment for each other that even during the dehydration process and the tissue processing, they didn't break. Yes, sir? Ouch. 
If I don't bang myself once, it isn't a good lecture. Yeah. Yeah. No, they don't. In a stratified epithelium, you don't find all of those domains. Now, there's something called pseudostratified epithelium in the respiratory tract and in the male tract. There you might have a tight junction, okay, but you won't necessarily have that full junctional complex. Anyone else? Nope. 220, okay. <sighs> Moving along. Okay, now we're going to get down then to the basal domain. And the basal domain then has, uh, can have a couple of different types of specialization. One are basal infoldings, and these are, these infoldings are uh, increases in surface area. Now in this case, these basal infoldings are accompanied by many mitochondria. And this is taken from the PCT, the proximal convoluted tubule in the kidney, which is main reabsorption site in the kidney. So that you're looking at a lot of surface area for reabsorption. Okay, so those are basal infoldings. And different cell types might have a few or none whatsoever. The other uh, types, and there are two, uh, of attachments are attachments to the matrix, and they, are, they use uh, molecules or proteins called integrins. Now, I didn't put it in this lecture, but Dr. Rogalski showed you a picture of actin, filaments attached to integrin, and that was in a cell where it would be used for focal adhesions. Uh, focal adhesions are important in tissue culture cells for attachments. They're also important, and I hope we can get to this later at, in connective tissue, they're important in wound healing for migration of cells, fibroblasts coming in. All right, so that's a focal adhesion. Integrin attached to an actin filament. However, the other one that we're going to talk to and that what we talk about that we're seeing in epithelial cells is the hemidesmosome, okay? So hemidesmosome, half a desmosome, okay? And it's half a desmosome because it is not attaching to another cell. It's attaching to the matrix. So there isn't going to be a corresponding plasma membrane underneath it. And in the case of the hemidesmosome, that integrin is actually going to be attaching into the plasma, or the, I'm sorry, the basal lamina, right? So if it is half of a desmosome, what then would you expect to be the cytoskeletal element here? Hmm? Intermediate filaments, right. What kind? Keratin. You're in an epithelium. Keratin, okay? Keratins are the thing in epithelia. All right? So keep those two straight, all right? The actin, always associated with movement, is associated with the integrins in focal adhesions, all right, either for migration of the cells or uh, in tissue culture. And the hemidesmosome is associated with integrins and intermediate filaments, okay? So here we have that hemi hemidesmosome, the intermediate filaments. It's going to have an attachment plaque and instead, the, mem the cell, the protein coming across that membrane is now not going to be desmocolon or desmoglan. It's going to be an anagram, right? And it will be attaching to a structure 
the basal lamina. And that basal lamina, then, is a structure which will contain, amongst other things, a specific collagen called collagen-4 and a molecule of glycoprotein called laminin, which basically has a cross shape to it. Um, and that is what the integrin is going to attach to. There are also going to be another, uh, many more stabilizing molecules within this structure. OK, this is what we're going to do. Take a five minute stretch, come back, we're going to do the basal lamina, and then I'm going to give you a 10 minute break to cover that two minutes when we don't have recording, all right? So before we start basal lamina, let's take a five minute break and then stretch, I'll turn lights on.
Okay. Okay, um, let's see if we can get basal lamina done before the two-minute warning. <laughs> All right. So then, in terms of uh, what we've just said, we have the hemidesmosome attached to intermediate filaments hmm, that has a plaque of proteins attaching the intermediate filaments to the plasma membrane, and then the transmembrane protein, excuse me, is an integrin that will attach to the laminin molecule of the basal lamina, and not to be confused with the focal adhesion, which is in a migrating cell or a cell in culture, which is attached to actin, right? Okay, integrins attached to actin in a focal adhesion. Okay, so the basal lamina then. Uh, the basal lamina has a special type of collagen in it that undergoes a processing a little differently than the other, some of the other collagens that is called collagen-4. And it forms what I always describe as a lattice or kind of a chicken wire appearance. And that collagen-4 molecule has a globular head and a tail, and which it maintains during processing. Okay, collagens. Collagens make some pretty big fibers. Type 1 collagen before the discovery of actin was considered to be the most prominent protein in the body. Now, actin takes that role. Um, collagen 1 is in all of the connective tissues uh, that you'll be you know, diving through uh, the fascias, the deep fascias around muscles, the epimysiums and endomysiums. It's in endoneuriums and perineuriums around the nerves. Um, it's in the dermis of the skin, uh, underneath cirrhosis and mucosas and the lamina propria. I'm throwing terms out that you're gonna, you will know off the top of your heads within a few weeks, okay? Um, but it's all over the body. In fact, one book described it as, if it wasn't for connective tissues, which are supporting tissues, which hold everything together, hold everything up, uh, the body would just be, we'd just be a blob of cells connected by a few neurons, okay? Because it's the connective tissues that actually give the shape and everything to it. Your skeleton is connective tissue. Specialized, but connective tissue. Okay, so um, there are going to be a, a number of different types of collagen. Uh, you will probably get, I hope, more about the processing of proteins uh, in biochem, and Dr. Uh, Wilk well, did a little bit of it. Uh, but basically, because collagen forms these fibers, a good portion of the collagen processing is done extracellularly. That is the most critical portion. The, the protein sequence, amino acid sequencing and everything is done intracellularly, but then to actually form these fibrils, it forms extracellularly in little spaces uh, outside of the cell called niches. And what happens is collagen itself, with its triple helical structure and these two uh, ends, a globular end and a tail, uh, goes through a process where proteases, collagenate, collagenases, cleave the two ends off of this collagen molecule. When it does that, you wind up with this very nice helical portion of the molecule, and that then can spontaneously interlink extracellularly. If it doesn't intracellularly, the cell's in trouble, having all these big aggregates of collagen fibers, all right?
So that's for fibrous collagens, and there are several different types of fibrous collagens. Uh, collagen can be processed so it only uses, loses one head or two so that it can form links between other fibers, etc. In the case of that lattice-forming collagen, collagen-4, it retains both the carboxy and amino terminal ends so that it can react with itself to form these lattice-like structures. So it's a backbone. And if you think about something that is like a screen or a lattice, things can come through. This allows the basal lamina to act like a sieve to allow certain things through. Then there are things like the laminin molecule, this cross-shaped molecule, which is a stabilizing molecule, which binds not only to the collagen, but also to, huh? Integrin, right, to the cell, okay? It's binding site for the cell. And then there are a number of other smaller stabilizing molecules in here, nitrogens and perlecans, et cetera, et cetera. Bottom line is that you've got a lot of protein here, glycoprotein, okay? Glycoprotein, sugar-containing proteins, right? carbohydrates. Um, and you have this very nice structure sitting here between the two tissue types and acting as a... Uh, a barrier and a comp comp compartmentalizing those two tissues. Now, I stressed the, quote, sugar or the glycoprotein portion of that because in a normal H&E stain, unless you have something like that basement membrane in the trachea where it's picked up some other uh, components from the connective tissue to make it look really thick, the basal lamina does not show up very well, all right? But using a stain, a periiotic acid shift stain, which is specific for sugars, which binds to sugars, you can then visualize sugar-containing moieties and the... Uh, basal lamina. Now, these are glands from the intestine, and here's all connective tissue around them, and glands are composed of epithelial cells, right, that came down from the sheet, and so they have a basal lamina. And when you stain that tissue with PAS, you wind up with this nice, distinct region which is the basal lamina. Now, I'm pretty much using basal lamina for every, everything here. I'm not making a distinction between basement membrane and basal lamina. Uh, some books do, and they use basement membrane, which is the older term, for light and basal lamina for EM. I, I get so confused at this point. I just, it's basal lamina, all right? And as long as you know what the components are and realize that, you're not going to see that ultrastructure, okay, on light microscopy, but you know what it is, I'll be very happy. All right, so periotic acid, uh, it's a, was a way of identifying terminal sugars in a carbohydrate. Periotic acid binds to the terminal sugar. And so using that with a shift reaction, you're able to get the stain. Also note that it is staining the mucus cells here, mucopolysaccharide, and it will stain anything that has a lot of glycoprotein in it, okay, a lot of sugar in it. Right? So PAS stain, that's one of the stains you need to know. And we will generally, we will tell you if it is not an H&E stain, okay? PAS, you need to know. There are some stains you just need to know what they are and what they are capable of staining. All right, uh, the basal lamina then and uh, the, epithe the connective tissue then interact at the region, I'm sorry, the epithelium connective tissue interact at the region of the basal lamina. So this portion here are the epithelial cells 
And then when we get down into this region here where we don't see many cells, but we see fibers, we're down in the connective tissue. And this hazy region here is that basal lamina, okay? Now, this clear area here has been shown to be an artifact of preservation. Uh, for many years, the basal lamina was broken down into a dense and a lucid region, but now it's believed that it is all one region immediately adjacent to the epithelial cell, and that the epithelial cell is making things like uh, laminin and collagen 4, and the uh, connective tissue underneath is making some anchoring types of collagens and molecules to anchor into the basal lamina from the other side. And then this then shows the, this portion where you would have fibroblasts with lots of fibers, these are collagen fibers, okay, underneath with dark spaces where the extracellular matrix would be, and we're going to be talking about that. Uh, in just a minute. The basal lamina is not is something that's found under epithelial cells, but it is also found around some other cells that where they are being com compartmentalized from the other tissues around them. That includes fat cells, adipocytes, uh, muscle cells, and some nerve cells. And in that case, it's not called a basal lamina because they don't have polarity, right? They don't have an apical and basal region. They're, it's just called an external lamina around the entire cell. Uh, functions. What can this basal lamina do? Well, first of all, as you've seen, it is a structural attachment for the epithelial cell to the matrix. Uh, it separates the two tissue compartments. That can be important in metastasis. It is filtration, okay? Uh, a permeability barrier in terms of what will and will not get through and get into the uh, epithelial compartment. There are some cells, like lymphocytes, that can cross that barrier. Huh? Okay, Dr. Becker probably talked about that, didn't he? Okay. Important here, I hope we get to this at the end, uh, scaffolding for cell organization and particularly for tissue regeneration after injury, okay? Um, when that basal lamina is intact, particularly in skin injuries, uh, then you can get tissue regeneration. Uh, and it, that scaffolding, that is a framework for cell movement as you're trying to close up wounds. And it's a physical barrier to cell migration. You're going to hear about this from me a lot, particularly in the mammary gland lecture, uh, because this is one way, whether or not cells have been able to break that barrier to get through that basal lamina is important in staging breast carcinomas, in staging melanomas in the skin. Right? So uh, the ability of cells to overcome the barrier of the basal lamina is very important. And it's uh, directly related to their ability to metastasize, whether or not they're going to be very aggressive. Uh, let's see, how are we doing here? 246, okay, not too bad. We're going to skip a bunch of stuff here. And go to connective tissues. Do you need to pull this up? Okay, we'll just start these a little bit and then we'll take a break, okay? I'm watching my time here. Um, another break. Okay, so the connective tissues then, we're going to leave the epithelial region above the basal lamina and we're going to move down into the region below the basal lamina. And we're getting into the region of tissues that are coming from the mesoderm. Connective tissues are broken down into uh, three major areas. The ones that have asterisks are going to be the ones that I'm going to cover today, okay? And those include embryonic connective tissues, 
like mesenchyme and mucous connective tissue. Now, don't confuse this with like a mucous cell. This is mucous connective tissue. It's different from the embryo. Connective tissue proper, or CTP. Uh, you've seen some of that already in terms of uh, looking at the fibers that were in the dermis of the skin. Those, that falls under the classification of connective tissue proper. Bulk of the lecture is going to be about that. And then the special connective tissues. Uh, I'm going to cover fat, adipose tissue. Dr. Becker, I do believe, covered blood yesterday. Mm -hmm. And then he will be back next week to cover bone and cartilage, all right? So you'll have all of the connective tissues out of the way by the end of lecture next week, Monday, okay? Then you can start on the other stuff like uh, nerve and muscle. All right, the connective tissue family of cells then will include things like the bone cells or the osteocytes, osteoblast. Uh, osteocyte always referring to the mature cell, blast referring to an immature cell. Uh, cartilage cells, all right, or the chondrocytes, chondroblasts, the adipocytes, which are the fat cells, smooth muscle cells, and then of course the fibroblast. Now, as you can see, it, we're showing arrows that things are interchangeable in terms of the fibroblast and the cartilage cells. And if you kept up with the news and stem cells, you know that there are a lot of these cells now that can come from other cells. And we will also talk about that at the end of the lecture. Um, Tell you what, it is. So we're going to stop there. We'll start with supporting cells. It's 10 to. We'll start again at 3 o'clock after this goes off. Okay, got it, okay?